Welcome to another session of DelphiCon 2023. My name is Ray Kanopka, and in this session we're going to be talking about how to spice up your applications with animations. So let's get started. Now specifically I'm talking about FMX applications. Um, unfortunately you can do a little bit of animation, certain techniques, uh, but the standard VCL classes really don't lend themselves to the advanced animation techniques that the FireMonkey framework gives us. So that's what we're going to be focused on uh, in this session is the FMX classes. And so we're going to start off going through some of the basics, the, the core features and properties of animations that we need to understand in order to incorporate them properly into our applications. So we'll look at the classes, the properties, things like triggers, animation types, even interpolation. Have lots of examples that illustrate all of these different features so we can understand which animation feature do we want to use when we're building them, incorporating them into our apps. We're going to talk about topics like synchronized animations. When I have multiple things going on that I want to animate, how do I ensure that that's a smooth transition from one to the other? Uh, things like animating over a nonlinear path uh, is valuable to, if that's something that you need. And I've had needs for each of these different examples. Uh, so that's where they're coming from. A uh, concept called animation time codes uh, is very valuable when you have multiple things that you need to keep in sync sync and you don't want one to kind of get in front of the other um, and so that's important to have some way to uh, to have a time code uh, to synchronize um, multiple objects that are being animated to make it a smooth transition. And then we'll have an example at the end about tab transitions, which is very common in our mobile devices, uh, being able to switch from one view to another. Tab control works well. How do we get animations for that? It's actually quite simple. So let's dig into some of the animation core concepts. The key piece to remember with animation is that you are changing a property value over time. That, that's it when you think about it. Uh, and if we fully understand that, then what we're going to cover next and, and the, all the examples will make a lot more sense because that's all we're doing is we're animating, we're changing some value of a property over time. That could be the position, uh, it could be a color, it could be the opacity, anything that can be changed, we can change it over time. And by doing so, that gives us animations. So what are some of the common things? I already hit on some of these, the position, the opacity, uh, rotation angle. Uh, actually, that's the first example I'm going to be showing. So anything that can be changed, can be changed, can be animated over time. Uh, one of the things to note, this is one of the reasons why uh, various properties in FMX are singles, are floating point values as opposed to straight integers, because a floating point value is allows you to have a smoother animation between one point and another, because in order to do the animation, you divide up the starting point to the ending point, the start value, end value of the property change, and divide it up into sections and how far you're going to do that through the animation duration. Um, floating point numbers give us a much smoother animation approach for that. So to do all of the work, fortunately FMX gives us uh, some classes that are built in that we can leverage. And um, most are basic uh, start value, end value animation types. And they're based on what you're animating. So if we're animating an integer or a floating point number, or even a color and so forth, that's I have some start value zero, I have an end value of 10, I wanna animate that over 0.7 seconds. Well, well, we'll get to how the animation is done in a little bit, but a straight linear animation would be divide that start to end value in even chunks across 0.7 seconds and there's my intermediate values. The integer is a kind of interesting one because what you know if that works out to a fractional you're still going to round it so you might have it go to one then to three then to four then to seven you know or six and it jumps around that way. Floating point numbers are much smoother because the division works better. Uh, gradients and rectangles, you can think of like, oh, I want to change the, the a start rectangle, which is a bounds for a control, for example. So if I wanted to animate a button from one part of my screen and make it 
go to a bigger part or of an image or a frame of some kind the rectangle animation will allow us to do that now there's also the ability to animate things over a series of values not necessarily a start end date or a start and end value uh, these are typically driven by a key animation so you have float key color keys um, I have an example of this this is really if you think about I have a dictionary of key values of time po points in my animation and what do I want the value of this property because again I'm animating the values of a property so what do I want that property value to be at various points key points in the animation cycle so that's where these animation series values of these types are, are important uh, path animation is another again i have an example of that where i want to animate something over a path well that's going to de determine where the position of something is when you're dealing with a path animation and then uh, there's also uh, a really nice one. It's a fun one. Uh, it's a bitmap list animation. It's very much like a manual way of doing an animated GIF. Uh, so if you have a series of images that you want to animate through, you can do that quite easily. So supporting the animation classes themselves, uh, inside of those basic types there's some shared common properties amongst all of them uh, you'll have a start value stop value of course the duration is one of the most common ones how long does that animation sequence last um, adding on to that you know whether the animation is enabled or not you might want to control that you don't want to necessarily remove it but you don't want it to occur under certain circumstances likewise we have the the loop does the animation just loop when it's done uh, does it go in reverse so when it's finished does it unwind itself um, you can also have it automatically just do the opposite of it from the get-go so there's lots of capabilities uh, start and stop methods are very important if we want to manually start the process um, likewise we can stop an animation in sequence if we so choose uh, I really don't have a, a not run into a need to do that uh, but it's available should you need to uh, some neat events are in place when it comes to animation so there's an on process event which does allow you to hook into that process so if you wanted to do something and respond to know like okay where in the process of the animation it is you could do that it's unlikely that you would do that because you don't really want to interrupt or do anything extra while the animation is going on that you don't need to um, typically if you are starting some other process and things you're going to have some other mechanism that you're going to monitor for the process of that where the animation itself is really just you want to let that run and finished and that's the key piece this event is very important uh, because this gets fired when the animation is finished and when that happens then we can do something in response to it maybe it's changing the underlying state of our UI maybe it's fire up a secondary animation so I want to chain one animation animation to another you could work with it with delays like start animation one and then after delay start animation two but if you really want them to be in sequence you want to wait until animation one is finished before you kick off animation two and the unfinished event gives us that ability so let's take a look at a number of examples So I have Delphi 11.2 uh, running up here and uh, this project with all of the sample projects, uh, the groups all included in the source code uh, link that will be shown at the end. Um, but this first one, we're going to start out really simple. Uh, I have a couple radiant shapes, radiant shapes you can download from uh, Get It within uh, Rad Studio. Uh, they're FMX shape controls. I've just got a couple on the screen here to uh, give us a little bit fancier visualization of what we're doing. And what these two buttons can do or what th this demo was doing as you probably gathered from the buttons there is that they're going to rotate these two arrows and how do we rotate them what do we want to do well fortunately fmx gives us a rotation angle 
and so whenever we go and we find a property like rotation angle if any property has a little film strip next to it that means that it is something that can be animated over um, that's what the, the film strip is indicating now because mine is enabled on the rotation angle that means i've already done this i've already established a rotate uh, an animation class to this property and I can see that by looking at the structure pane. So on my radiant arrow which is the first one the chevron arrow is the second one and you can see that I have a float animation here. Now let me go ahead and click that and what that does is these are the properties that I was showing in the previous slide. So I have a start value and an end value and in this rotation I'm going to animate the rotational angle of zero which is straight vertical in this point and rotate it all the way to 360 which means I'm expecting it to do a, a, a full loop revolution for the animation. How long is it going to take? It's going to take two seconds. So this the duration is in seconds and you can have floating point values here. So you can have 1.2, 1.8, whatever you'd like. Um, I'm not having a delay so I want to get it started and just once I hit start animation I want it to start animating the value of the rotation angle property from 0 to 360 over two seconds and, and that's pretty much all I have so um, let me go ahead and run this okay so I have my two buttons I'm just going to cover the first one so when I go ahead and click OK we can see that it is indeed rotating from 0 to 360 in order to get around. Um, you will probably realize that 0 to 360 I couldn't do 0 to 0 because there'd be no change in it so because I wanted to go in that direction that's how I make that um, go completely around is even though they're the same equivalent value they need to be different so it's ever increasing between each one. The secondary uh, example here is on this chevron and it's using a float key animation. It's still doing it on the rotation angle but what does this do? Well this is driven by a set of keys. Basically portions through the process of when we want certain changes of the value to take place and so I'm going to uh, it's a collection so if we bring up the collection and well before I do that let's look at the duration is still two seconds and um, there no note that there's no starting or end value in there it's driven by these keys and so typically you're going to have at least two you're going to have a starting key and an ending key and possibly whatever else is in the middle of it so we're going to start with the key of zero which is in the process that we're going so at the start of zero if you will um, we're having the zero angle value is going to represent whatever property value we're animating over then if we go to the second point this is saying point four into the process so not 0.4 seconds but 0.4 of the duration that I have now my duration is two seconds is going to be 0.8 I want the value to be 180 degrees so in that first 40 percent of the duration I want the angle to get all the way down to be half of my uh, rotation then I'm going to uh, the next key is I'm saying well at 0.6 through the process so 20% further along I want the value to go back to 120 degrees so the direction doesn't always need to be going in the same place I'm having the time key so 60% through the process I want the value to back up a little bit and then the final key is at the end when I'm 100% if you will one through the whole process I want to be at that 360 so what does that look like let me run that one real quick and when I go ahead and click this we'll see that it rotates down rotates back and then rotates up a little quicker and the speed of each of those may vary because it's keeping it within the two, two seconds duration but doing a little bit more work for those keys. So depending on what you need to animate, how you want it to do it, you have a lot of flexibility. 
Uh, one thing before we go to uh, the, the next example is um, how do we add an animation? I've already had those added in. Um, one thing that we can do with that uh, quite easily is you find a property that you can animate, for example, the opacity. And if I drop this down, you'll see that I can create a new float animation or a new float key animation. If I just select create new float animation, it will add a new one. And that's really kind of cool because you don't have to have just one animation for a given object. So I'm having another one that's animating the opacity property. Float animation one is the, the rotation angle. This one is doing the opacity. I'm going to start from one and I want it by the time I'm done to be point uh, two. Um, so 20% visibility is what I'm looking to do over. Well, that's kind of quick. Let's make this 2.5 seconds. And then over in my rotation button, instead of starting float animation one, let me start up float animation two. And so now if I run this, what we're going to see is I'm not going to rotate anymore because I'm not performing that one but we can slowly see that over two and a half seconds, the opacity of my property, again, I'm changing properties over time. That's all animations they're doing. And that's what I get from here. Okay. So next up, I wanna spend a little time talking about triggers. Uh, another helpful feature of animations, the animation classes that allow us to do some things uh, to fire off an animation based on some external event. Um, we did it on a button click and in those previous examples, so something was done, we performed an action and we started up the animation. But certain things we would want to have animate automatically for us. Um, some of the most common ones are when you move the mouse over something, uh, we want to be able to respond to a trigger for that or if we've clicked on something, uh, if it's been pressed. So these triggers all have an is prefix to it, like is mouse over, is drag over, etc. Um, and based on those, we can put an expression inside of a condition in these properties to determine whether the trigger fires up the animation or not. So let's take a look at a trigger definition. So let me switch back over to here. That's my second example. I'm gonna make sure I activate that right now. So I have another shape, uh, it's a radiant shield. And you can see that I've added a color animation. So different type, um, that is off on the fill color. Uh, so the fill color property has an animation. And if we look at it, it's animating from red to medium blue. Um, and so, over the course of a half second, it's going to change the color, which means it's going to show some purplish blends of the two and then eventually land on the medium blue color. Kind of fun. Well, when do I do it? I don't have any other buttons around here that triggers it uh, to start. Um, there's nothing in the code that does it to start. Um, it's all driven by the animation class with these triggers. So I have a trigger and a trigger inverse. The trigger basically says, okay, do the animation as designed from start to stop. The trigger inverse says, okay, if this condition is met, do the animation from the stop value to the start value backwards. And so all we're doing is we're saying, okay, we're going to start this if the mouse over condition for this control is true. And likewise, we switch it when it's not. So pretty straightforward. Let me go ahead and run it and you can see the effect. So as I move the mouse over, the triggers are, are invoked and it reverses the animations uh, as needed. So very clever. You can do the same things you can animate. So you can do, you can make something uh, grow a little bit. Very common in some, you know, uh, mirror type desk interfaces where you highlight something, it gets a little bit larger. So you could do a rectangle animation that's done through a trigger uh, to do the same thing. You could add glow effects on a hover. So it looks like it glows behind it. All those things are, are, are available. Next up, we have to start talking about interpolation. This is how does the animation values change? Um, 
it's simple to think of it done linearly. We take a time duration and we take the two start and stop values. And then if we know how long it is and we periodically chunk that up into sections, what are those intermediate values? Well, it's just math. It's a math equation that we can figure that out. Well, if you start applying other math equations, that's what interpolation gives us. So the default, again, I've said this a couple times now, it's, it's a linear, linear interpolation. We take a constant rate, so we divide it evenly, you know, n number of times every, you know, for whatever duration or uh, frequency we want the change to occur, that is what causes our property value changes. But there's other values um, and you can sense once you realize it's all math, that's where you see there's a quadratic. It's the, you know, there's a quadratic, a cubic, a quartic. You know, these are various powers of exponents, sinusoidal, exponential, even circular. Um, and then there's some fun ones that come along. You have a bounce, even an elastic uh, and so forth. But it's very hard to visualize what these are without some sort of visual representation. And um, but you can look at the help, which is great, but I have a better way. Um, we're gonna look at an example that illustrates all of these at the same time so that we can really see and understand why they're different. Uh, the animation type is kind of interesting, uh, mostly because I think it is the wrong default. <laughs> um, it's defaults to in, because it's an enum and it's the first value, in happens to be the default value of it. But in my experience, you will most often change this to out or possibly in and out. And what this does is it basically describes when the, 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 the math is applied to the distribution of the values. Um, and so was, is it done up front or is it done at the end, in, out, or is it done on both? And so uh, to illustrate that, let's take a look at our next example. So we're going to go to our interpolation form, switch my project. And what I have here is a, a number of radiant rings um, to demonstrate the various pieces. And they're all tied. They all have uh, on their um, uh, positions. Their position wise is what we're animating. So they're, they're going to drop down in this view, um, but they're going to do so differently. Uh, each one has a different animation type that's assigned, which is labeled inside of the, the middle of each one. Um, we control whether we can loop it, if we auto reverse it, how which way it applies uh, the distribution, and then of course how fast we go. Um, so nothing real interesting. There's nothing in the code to show. It's just the effect of what these animation types do. So let's go ahead and run this. So to start, uh, we're going to keep it in as the default. And then if I animate this, we can see how each one changed. Now, they all started at the same time and they all ended at the same time, um, which is important because it's the that's a fixed amount based on what you set the duration property to. I mean, you can change it, but it's again, it's all set. I have them all set to be the same. The linear one goes straight up and down. It doesn't change. It doesn't look like it accelerates. The, the cubic, circular, and quadratic all seem to do the same kind of thing, uh, but they, they accelerate a little bit differently in the middle. And that is driven by, if you would think of on a graph paper, uh, in the Y changes for a circle that's around. So you'll see it kind of go up a little bit, then it goes up faster, slows down, then it goes down and accelerates. A quadratic curve is obviously has a much more steeper angle or curvature, so you'll see more of an impact. Uh, the back bounce and other ones tend to be uh, more interesting. So if I animate this again, um, and we can see that this activity, this bouncing is happening at the, at the front, and then it goes at the end. I'm going to turn that off and change it to out. And this is more like what you would think a bounce would be, for example. So everything starts out and then ends down at the bottom. The elastic even goes beyond the bounce and then gets pulled back um, into place. Uh, what's really kind of fun is we can, we can hit the auto loop and... Uh, we can start these up and then it'll uh, get down to the bottom and then it reverses it. So it does it back and forth. And here's where you can really see the difference between the two um, and, and how linear is just going straight up and down. And these all bounce and affect differently. If you really want to have some fun, make it the in out 
and then you get activity on both sides of the animation. So how it starts up and then how it finishes. All right, so depending on what your needs, you just pick the right interpolation value. So next up, I want to talk about synchronizing animations. And so um, I've mentioned this before, but just to reillustrate, you know, I have multiple, uh, in order to animate multiple properties on an object, each property needs its own animation object. Um, which you can certainly do. Like in the previous that example I had where I was changing the rotation angle and the opacity, I could start them both up. But if I'm doing that, I do need to make sure that I'm starting them both up at the same time, that their durations are both set to the same time. Um, you, you also have this issue to where if I've got more than two or if there's multiple things I need to do, you, you don't want them to be out of sync where you know the opacity kind of gets a little bit darker and then it kind of fades up because of the processing we, we want it, that to be evened out as much as possible so one of the things that uh we certainly as i said here we don't want to have that get out of sync but a technique that i've used many times to to handle these situations is to actually create a new property that is, is used to actually control the, the accumulation of the other animations. So remember, animating a, is, is simply a property change over time. Now what that properties change does is up to you. And so that's the technique that, that really kind of makes things uh, as we get more complicated, uh, pretty cool. So I'm gonna have an example, it's called digit drop. And let's take a look at that. So digit drop, uh, as, I mean, I'm going to run it and then we'll see what it does because then it'll become more uh, important in, in how this happens. So um, it's a display. Basically, I'm showing some number of, of wait time minutes for a certain place and I will uh, go ahead and drop a number down and we can see that these digits drop down from the top out of view and fall into place and you can tell that I'm using those interpolation techniques to make this happen. I'm using the bounce. Now what's interesting is when I change the value notice how the six and zero fall off the screen while the new value uh, the, the 15 comes into view and while that's happening you actually get to see both all four of the digits will be on the screen at one point so in order for that animation to fall and there's separate sections because the ones the, t the tens and the ones and even the hundreds they don't fall at the same rate um, so because you want it to kind of have this they don't all just come in at the same time that wouldn't be any fun uh, so in order to coordinate all of this, we, we can't rely on just saying, oh, animation one for the top cell, animation two for the bottom, start them both off and expect them to be completely in sync. What happens is, is you get little gaps. Uh, they get a little bit closer. They get a little bit farther away as the animation goes on because of rounding and positioning and timing. I didn't want any of that. I want this to be rock solid, drop them down. This is what we get. So let's take a look at the code of what this, uh, how did we, we do this? So to represent each of those digits, there's some, uh, some text fields that are in place. And if you open up the, the, the clip window, because I'm clipping everything that's above it and below it, so that's what that's serving. But we have the, the set of next values. So the ones, hundreds digits, the tens and the ones for the next values, these are the ones that are positioned kind of up. Um, they're gonna get repositioned in code so I'm just having there so I can click on them and then the 100s, 10s and 1s are inside of here and each one of them simply has uh, a rectangle if we need it um, uh, but that's uh, really just as a guide for testing and things but for now it's just a text control that we're using nothing fancy there's no properties on this that are being animated because again, I don't want to be animating the Y position of each of these controls separately. I need to animate them together. Well, the way I did that 
So if we go into our form here, and it's not that complicated. There's all the controls up at the top. I've created a special enum to wrap around the interpolation values. Um, but inside of here, I've got, uh, I'm manually going to create some animations. So I've got my ones, tens, and hundreds animations. So each of those columns are going to be an animation that I need to create. Well, the question then is, what do I animate? Well, that's where if I remember that an animation is a property that's changed over time, it doesn't matter where that property is. It doesn't have to be on an actual control that's on the form. I'm creating three new properties on the form that I'm going to animate over. And in what we'll see is as we set the, the positions, setting the positions for the ones column is going to do something. It's actually going to move the next digit and the current digit in the right place. And that's what I'm animating. So let's, let's continue on looking at the rest. Um, when I create the form, I'm setting some default properties, my clip window size, and I'm creating the animation objects. Here's where the work is. And what this is doing is I'm creating my first animation, which is just a straight float animation. My starting value is zero, which is the position that I want the cell to be at. Um, and I want it to go to the digit height because that's essentially what I'm animating. I'm animating the, the height of the digit cell. And so that's what's going down. Now, how it does that is through the interpolation, which is set here. And I have them all set to out because I want the bounce to actually be a bounce at the end when it comes into play. Now, the key thing here is what am I animating? I am animating, well, I'm animating the property name, which is digits one position for the object that is referenced in the parent. Now we don't see the parent get set when we do the animation over in the structure pane and or we take a property and we animate and drop that. That is set. That's why it shows up as a child of the control that we're animating. When we create our own animations, we need to set the parent appropriately. So we are setting the digits one position of the form that we're in. So great, we still don't know what is being animated yet. We just know we're going to have that. And then I'm having an unfinished handler. So when that's done, then I can, can you know do something. And we're gonna see what that is in a little bit. The tens and the hundreds are exactly the same, just animating a different position. Um, with one variation is that the duration is a little bit longer for the other two. And that gives it a little bit of an offset um, so of how they finish. Going down, uh, setting the value, this is the, the actual value. So when I set the property of the title bar and I say, okay, 45 minutes or 120, it figures out what the values based on the digit are. And then it kicks off the start the digit drop, which is the starting of the animation process whenever the value changes. So I'm gonna skip over that, the, the value changes. This is if it's just a change. So, um, this is doing when we change the drop style, all that's doing is changing the interpolation type. No big deal. Um, setting the clip window size, none of that's real fun. So start digit drop, what happens here? Well, I simply kick off all three of those animations. Now it's fine that those are all separate because I actually want them to be separate. But I'm when we look at what happens when we change digits one position, we're actually changing two controls on the form through a single property value change. And based on what the value comes in, that single value affects the height of both of those controls. And so this is how I can synchronize multiple properties across multiple objects through a single property change at the component a form level to ensure that everything is rock solid as I go through. Um, we're almost at the end here. So all three of those are the same except modifying the different positions. When the animation is finished, we simply reset uh, our various controls so that they're now at the, basically the, the next becomes the current and the, the old next value, the cell that represents that is positioned above out of view, hence negative digit height. 
so it's ready for the next time the value changes and each one does that when each of those are finished because it's moving a different set of cells to take care of that and so that's how you can use the on finish to reset for the next animation sequence which i highly recommend doing at the end rather than at the start of the animation because if you have to reset it then that may get into the visual cue of how the change is made and we don't want that to happen so that was digit drop let's move on to uh, the next fun one is path animations so path animations as it suggests is we can do um, non-linear uh, positional changes and so we can actually have something move over a path object and a path is just a vector based uh, you know set of coordinates or points connected through a path through a curvature and we can really coolly animate over that um, and here's an example where the on process event uh, is very valuable I know it's like not often used but this was one where it really was important to use because I was needing to make an extra adjustment in this example you'll see just a moment uh, of where while I'm in this animation I need to alter the appearance of the object that's being animated so what does all that mean well let's let's take a look um, before we get to the code though one of the things that in order to make this work um, as you'll see um, I, w I needed to create an animation that had multiple objects all coming into view at different times but it needed to be a loop and I couldn't just create them all um, to be with necessarily the same duration because the paths have different lengths and so if I want them to all be traveling at the same speed they're going to end at different times and so you have to kind of have some way to synchronize across multiple animations not multiple properties but multiple animations that's the difference of where the time code concept comes into play so we'll show uh, how I've implemented that so let's switch over and talk about driving paths so driving paths we really kind of I'll show this really quick uh, but what we've got is you can see there's a whole bunch of paths in there not all of them are used they're really there to show examples of different things I was trying out and I've got some vehicles here so before we get started let me just go ahead and run this very quickly and what we will see is that these cars are being animated across the path and the, each one is a different path but the loop is maintained some are coming into view out of view and it's it keeps that order so it was important to synchronize these multiple animations and the key thing is is you want the cars to actually change their rotation angle as it's going along the path because I couldn't just keep it flat and being looking to the left and then going around the path it would look crazy uh, so how do we how did I do that so let's take a look at the code here so surprisingly not a terrible amount of code but there there's some work in here um, so the the key things that we have um, are the uh, let me just drive into the middle here we're going to use some um, path animations so that's the new piece here we need to know some starting points and some last car points to keep track of things uh, this uh, last drive times and process times uh, will come into play uh, I mentioned this time code that's actually being managed by a timer so we're, we're using one timer uh, this time code timer to manage all of that and then as we get to the implementation we'll see how all these things play out so in our startup we are uh, creating our starting point that's our, our the, the layout for the car so each car is inside of a layout um, just to make it easier they're separate uh, if you click on one you have an image of a car but the car is inside of a layout and uh, and then each car has its image or layout has its image and um, that makes it easier to rotate I can have a fixed size for the layout and the image could be different if necessary for what I needed 
um, to initialize the content. Um, really, all this is doing is I'm, I'm hiding all of the strokes that I had added in uh, for the paths. So the lines that were showing up at design time, I wanted to see where they were. They're not available at runtime. And I'm hiding each of the con the cars themselves from their layout. So nothing is visible at startup except the background road. Then to create the animation objects, quite simple. I'm just creating a new path animation. The parent of that is the layout. And I'm just these are setting some things for the animation. The animation, because it's a path animation, needs a path. And that's what it's animating. So I don't have a property per se like we did before. The object of, that's being animated is a path. Um, and it really means it's, it's starting from a path to the end over a period of time. So the interpolation is the same things. I'm running it linearly. I don't need it to be anything else, constant speed limit, if you will. Um, but I'm fitting it to the bounds rectangle. If you don't do this, then by default, because they're basically like an SVG file, the path, it will be really small. I need it to fit the size of my bounding rectangle for the control that's there. So that's why you have path data going into the path. And then the rectangle that it fits into is the bounding rect. Duration is duration, how long it takes. The various animation objects, I'm creating one animation object for each of the cars that I'm running. And the key piece here is this on process. So while the animation is occurring periodically, it like on a value change, it's going to call this event handler and we're going to respond to that. The starting of all three is pretty much the same. All we're doing is we're, we're making sure we have the layout for it. Um, once we do, we set up its starting position for each one. We set the opacity to one so it's now visible. And then we start driving. Pretty straightforward. The time code is really coordinating all three of those things. So as it says here, we want to ensure multiple sequences don't get out of sync and start to overlap one another. Um, that can happen if the system gets too busy. It can happen if you've got one animation that's taking a longer time than the other. And if it just does a straight loop, then it will kick off earlier. And so you might have cars colliding with each other. So in this case, the time code gives us that ability to say, nope, we're going to sequence this up and start up anew. And so it, this is just doing some calculations based on some frequencies. You can change these to see what the impact is. And then we just simply start driving for each of those. So the key piece is the, the remaining part is in these on process event handlers for each of these. And this is what happens when the car is moved along the path. Well, the key piece is that the rotation angle needs to change to be perpendicular to the angle of the line of the path that I'm on. Basically, we start getting into trig. So we need the arc tangent of the delta between our two positions. So this is why we have the, the, the last position and the current position. So we know from the last slice to this one, what angle was the, that was the car in its direction. We figure out the arc tangent for that, the perpendicular angle. We then set our uh, the angle of the, the, the arc tangent to uh, our rotational angle of our image, and that allows the car to be driving along and turning along the path. And the same has happened for driving path one, two, and three. And yes, you probably could um, share this in some way, looking at the sender. Uh, in this case, as I was building it, I was just kind of making it clear each of these three things were being handled by separate. So if you did want them to be different or do something odd, you could do that. And that is uh, some path animation with some time codes, a lot of fun stuff in there.
Okay, moving on, uh, just a couple more examples. The first up is uh, tab transitions with FMX tab controls. Uh, normally when you switch to a different page, a different tab and a tab control, it just switches it immediately. It doesn't do any transitions. Um, but with mobile apps, it's really common to have a slide transition between views in our apps. And that's where the standard actions of next tab action and next uh, previous action can become really valuable because it has built in slide transitions. Uh, so let's take a look at that as well as another uh, wizard example I have. Um, but first, we'll, we'll look at this tab. I have a, a simple application with a, a list box of items. Um, when I go and click on them, I want uh, to switch it. But by default, um, I tap on an item, and it goes to a new view, and it just immediately goes to the view. When I hit back, it immediately changes. I can add a nice transition by adding in some standard actions to the, uh, my action list. So drop an action list on your FMX form. Um, you can add them by doing new standard action, finding the tab section, and then picking which tab you want. Uh, the change tab allows you to jump to previous, uh, to further tabs in the chain or back. Uh, and it figures out which direction the slide needs to be based on the index order. So a lower index means go left, Low, larger index or goes right, light, lighter, larger index goes left. You're moving forward and backwards. The one piece to remember is you have to set the tab control property of each of the actions so that it knows which tab control it is being applied to. Once you do that, um, we can look at the code and whenever I click an item, instead of just changing the tab index, I'm invoking the next tab action. Likewise, when I hit the back button on the other screen, I'm going to navigate back. Now, when I go ahead and run this, what we will see is some nice slide animations. So I click on a list item. It slides into view. I can slip back. Again, there's no data transfer or anything that's really fancy happening here, but the mechanics of doing the tab transition is what was important there. The other example I wanted to show, another uh, kind of feature of combining the tab transitions with some of the other animation techniques that we had in there is in creating a wizard. So in this wizard, we have a basic wizard application. You hit the next button and there's a list of tasks that come up uh, for us to see. Not really, you know, let, can we make this fancy? Well, what, let me go ahead and run it and we can see what the impact is. Again, I have to run the right application here. So when I run the wizard, what we can see happen is both the tab transition is going to start. So I'm on tab one, I go to tab two, but then the tasks animate up from the bottom. So a nice kind of visual cue, hey, look at these, we have these tasks and we can fire that. And of course the back animation goes into play. And the way that's done is pretty straightforward. If we go look at the code, um, there's really not a lot of code in here. This is it. Um, the capsules, those represent the task buttons that were created. Um, I set my tab control to be the first page. Um, when I hit the next button, uh, I'm simply changing, I'm animating the individual capsules, but note that I'm doing this manually because I'm, I'm not doing it on the capsules themselves because I want all three to kind of animate a little bit differently. Um, in the sense of where I'm getting the start is based off of each individual capsule's height in the stack of where I want that to be because I could have varying sizes. So the, the starting position is adjusted for what the display would be. So the end value, you have the start value, then the end value that you set it to, and then go ahead and animate. And I'm using the Quartic to give it kind of a quicker acceleration. This is the duration, here's the start delay. So the I set up the animation and essentially tell it to fire, but wait four tenths of a second before doing so. Immediately following, because this is non-blocking, it executes the next tab, which causes the page to slide. As the page is sliding over, this animation kicks up and we get the task buttons that show up on the screen. 
So those are all the examples I have. You can download uh, all these sample materials from my Delphi by Design site in the download sections. You'll find links to all of those. Um, I thank you very much for tuning in and listening to my session. Uh, as I'm sure you can, uh, can tell from my voice, I do really enjoy the animation capabilities that are in FMX. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a really a cool way to add a, a nice spark uh, to your application when used appropriately. Don't overdo it. Um, but please uh, join me uh, after this session. I'll be joining live to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you very much. And again, uh, enjoy the rest of DelphiCon 2023. Thank you.